As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have a returning guest today, Ann Barnhart, founder of former Barnhart Capital Management, is with us here again on Reluctant Preppers to talk to us about a real asset that not many of us uh, may in recent years uh, know anybody who owns, and that is productive ranch land, farmland, and cattle, and livestock. Anne, thank you for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be back. If you could first uh, give us just a brief understanding of your, uh, why we're asking you as an expert in this area, uh, your background in the area of uh, livestock management, herd management, that sort of thing. Sure thing. I mean, most people on the internet know me for completely different reasons, burning Korans, et cetera, et cetera, railing against the the political system and my, you know, my Catholic apologetics and things like that. What my actual vocation is, what I even went to to university to study, um, I have a, I have an undergraduate degree in animal husbandry, specializing basically in beef cattle production and agricultural economics from Kansas State University. I then immediately after graduating went to Denver and immediately started work as a commodity broker. I was I was licensed as a commodity broker at the age of 20. I was for a period one of the youngest commodity brokers in the world, and I worked for 15 years as a commodity broker. That's what Barnhart Capital Management was. It was a commodity brokerage firm. Um, And it was just me. It was a one-man operation. And I also was a cattle marketing consultant, which is actually the work that I'm that I'm much more proud of. Um, I was trained by an old timer um, who is who is since deceased, but um, I was trained by an old timer in the in the old school methods of trading cash cattle. When, and when I say cash cattle, what I mean is living actual cattle, cattle on the hoof. Now, before this, all of my clients through the commodity brokerage were, in fact, farmers and ranchers. I was, de- I was a commercial hedge broker. Um, there's this term that's floating around in the financial industry that's completely misleading, um, hedge funds. They, they, assign, they attach this word hedge in order to, to lend credibility and legitimacy to themselves. What hedging implies is that you're not speculating, is that you're managing risk and that you're, and what it really truly means is that you're using forward delivery contracts to manage risk and so forth on, um, on actual physical commodities. In my case, cattle, corn, wheat, soybeans, that was my bread and butter. And so all my clients, like I said, were ranchers and farmers, and I was a true commercial hedge broker. So yes, I was brokering futures and options contracts in Chicago, where, you know, back in the day, if you've ever seen like the movie Trading Places or anything like that, when all the guys are standing in the pit screaming and yelling and screaming and yelling and trading these contracts back and forth with each other, what I would have been is I would have been the person who was on the other side of the telephone that those guys or those clerks are talking on and getting orders from, and then reporting the fills back to. That's what I did. That was my job. And then the cash cattle marketing, after I was trained by this old timer, I started teaching and supporting the old school, true, non-speculative, almost totally lost skill set of how to actually trade um, physical living cattle and, and make enormous amounts of money doing it because it's a skill set that after World War II and after um, Roosevelt instituted the welfare state, basically, for all intents and purposes, surprise, surprise, everyone in agriculture basically lost the skill set. And now where we are with American agriculture is that it's descended into this farce of pure speculation and on the and on the grain side especially massive government manipulation and intervention into the the grain markets with all of these price supports and guarantees to the point now I bet a lot of your your um your listeners are probably savvy to this but the american grain production paradigm now is so disordered that many many farmers will intentionally plant crops 
that they know will fail and that they know will fail because of the geographical location either there's you know there's insufficient number of heat units there's insufficient moisture things like this because the paradigm is so messed up with all this government intervention and price you know price supports and things like that they can make more money intentionally planting a crop that will fail and be guaranteed a certain level of income by doing that rather than planting what they should be planting and what is it would be the best productive match for their geographical location. Right. That's how bad things are. Now, there's not intervention like that yet so far in the cattle markets. The cattle markets are one of the most pure and liquid cash commodity markets it left certainly in North America and, and in the world. And so the cattle markets are just great. And you, you combine that with the fact that all of the cattlemen over the last 50, 60, 70, 80 years have lost the true skill set of how to be savvy marketers and really understand what they're doing in terms of trading cattle. When I was taught that skill set, I was basically the the only person left on the block who was who was teaching any of this and trying to keep the skill set alive. And I do still I don't teach live schools anymore because I've had to go, you know, I went underground and went off the radar, but I do still have and I still can sell the 16 hour long DVD version of that seminar that I teach, taught and support. Okay. And uh, if you could talk to us just for a minute, uh, what people's interest as far as what is what are the major benefits of owning uh, productive farmland, ranch land, livestock? What is that fundamentally different from or how does it how is it what are its advantages over other types of assets that you can hold? Well, I think first and foremost is the inflation protection and the security of the fact that it's actually food. Um, I I am known on the internet uh, in the in the metals trading circles because I advocate invest partial investment in gold and silver and metals, but I'm not a metals bug. And the reason I'm not a metals bug and I'm not the kind of person who thinks that precious metals just solve everything is because these are assets that are essentially stagnant and they are fantastic for when there is economic calamity, catastrophe, and you need to get your wealth into something, not necessarily with the intent of turning a profit on it, but in terms of holding your wealth together. That is what, um, that's what metals are, are fantastic for. You think about gold, you think about silver, you can't eat it, you can't do anything with it. It's just there, it's shiny, it's portable, and in in catastrophic situations, it helps a person hold their wealth together and minimize the losses that that might occur in an economic catastrophe, the outbreak of war, the breakdown of civilization. Okay, great, fine, that's fine. But let's think about let's think about productive land and let's think about cattle. What are these things? These are real assets that are food that can be eaten. And in the case of cattle, and also to a large extent in the sense of grains, because a grain crop is growing, cattle are growing. With each passing day, if you can put feed in front of these animals, they are, they are putting on weight and they are becoming intrinsically more valuable because they are gaining weight. And so you can be in a situation where you are in an economic catastrophe, and if you're holding cattle or if you're able to, to produce um, forage, foodstuffs, grain, and you can defend and you can execute this, you still have a, an investment that is generating a return just by, by its very nature. Now, the big difference between the grains and the agricultural products is obviously the agricultural products, these are perishable, right? You can't just you can't just have a steer and just let it get to be where it's 12 years old. You know, you have to, at some point, you have to harvest animals in exactly the same way that you have to harvest crops. If you're going to invest in grain farming, you have to have the ability to harvest and market the crop within a fairly tight window every year. So that is one limitation, and that's a big difference, whereas gold, we all know gold literally lasts forever. It doesn't tarnish. It doesn't rust. There's no degradation in it. That is, that's one argument pro for precious metals, but on the other hand, if you still have some 
freedom, flexibility of movement, you're going to want to look at these food commodities. And again, just reminding you of the fact it's food. No matter what happens, no matter what happens, if there's total, complete collapse, as long as there are still living human beings on this planet, which there will be, those human beings will be consuming food, will be wanting food. And so what you're dealing with is really the most intrinsically valuable commodity on earth in the universe, because it is something that is utterly, utterly necessary to human life. And uh, you mentioned that there's also uh, tax advantages to holding that. I, I noticed I saw I saw a um, a one of these advertisements recently. I believe it was it was starts out with former Congressman uh, Ron Paul talking about uh, the, the truths about the long term uh, scandal that's been covered up uh, the the foundation of the Fed, the de the uh, debasement of the U.S. currency, and on and on. The national debt skyrocketing, a hockey stick curve, and then, and then it leads on to so you need to find out what you need to do to to hold the, the, the most uh, uh, wealth-preserving uh, asset that the, mo that the mega-rich have or whatever. And then it transitions. Um, it says it's not gold and silver and it's not other things. And it shows the chart to basically just having gone up and up and up over decades and decades and decades of value. And uh, some commentary from people online have said that they paid the whatever it was, $99, to get the video set. And basically it's saying you need to own of uh, productive farmland and ranch land. Well, that isn't even a question of taxes. And again, you're talking to the wrong person about, you know, wanting to pontificate about tax advantages because as you and I assume most of your listeners know, I declared a tax strike years ago. That's why I had to go underground. Um, I'm, not, I'm not paying taxes to the United to the former United States government. Good heavens, I don't consent to this government. It's not the United States. It, the, the United States, the Constitutional Republic, clearly no longer exists. The rule of law is not in force. I do not consent to be governed by this putsch regime. And the notion that I would continue to pay taxes into this is, is just an, a complete absurdity. From a moral perspective, to me, in my mind, paying taxes to the Washington, D.C. putsch regime is basically the same thing as offering the pinch of incense to the statue of Caesar. St. Polycarp chose, chose death, chose to be executed, rather than, even with the state begging him, come on, old man, all you have to do is offer one little pinch of incense, just throw it at that statue and everything will be fine. And he said, no, you're, you're going to have to go ahead and kill me because I'm not going to betray Christ. That's pretty much where I am right now with this whole question of taxes. Uh, y the listeners, they can, you have to make that decision for yourself. Um, what, what agricultural commodities provide is a hedge against inflation. That's, that's what we should be focusing on here. The truth of the matter is, is that when inflation happens, let's look, for example, right now, this is happening in Venezuela. Okay. So Venezuela, this failed socialist state, is now going into the true hyperinflationary stage where their, their inflation is now running, I think I saw the other day, 1,500%. They're at 1,500% inflation, and that's mild. It'll get a lot worse than that before, before it's all over, and those people are starving to death. What, when, when that happens in a society, units of value, aside from, from just absolute complete desperation, what is going to maintain a, a relatively close unit of value relative to whatever nonsense currency that a nation state is, is putting forth is going to be your food commodities. Um, and I think it could also be argued that in, in the modern Western world, the petroleum, you could also kind of make that argument for petroleum, that there will be kind of a, a connection to reality as people absolutely need energy. But I think even more primordial than that is the dynamic with food. And so what happens is, is that if you are in an inflationary or hyperinflationary situation, if you're holding productive farm ground and you can defend it and maintain it and continue to work and, and harvest and so forth, if you have cattle, what will happen is as the, inf as the inflation happens and the value of the currency just descends and 
prices go through the roof, what will lead all that will be your food commodities. And so your wealth will, again, be held together in a, in a very real way because the price of the cattle, the price of the land, the price of the grain, the price of all these food commodities will go up, 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 up as the inflation happens. And so because you are holding the primordial commodity, you will be essentially protected from from the inflation in that sense. And so you will continue to have buying power that other people do not have because your money is not sitting in some bank in zeros and ones in worthless US dollars or whatever it is that you probably can't even access anyway. Your money will be tied up in these in these assets that are because of what they are themselves will be going up in price with the inflation, thus maintaining your buying power. I even have on the DVD set, um, I reproduced it in 2011. I did a second edition. And one of the reasons that I did that is because I saw what was coming. I saw with the Obama regime and so forth, that, and that the fact that the, re, the Obama regime would be stoking and fomenting a race-based civil war, which, I, again, I've been proved exactly correct on this, and it's not because I'm any prophet or super genius. It's just looking at history and looking at these people and what they've been saying for decades it was their intention to do. Gin up a race-based, race-based civil war. Uh, collapse the southern border with Mexico, allow for just unlimited invasion by not only Latin Americans, who will then go directly onto the welfare rolls, but also by Musloids, the army, the jihadist army coming in through the South American border. So I see, okay, we're going towards economic collapse. Um, look at what they're doing to the debt. Look at how they're debasing the currency, $19 trillion dollars is what Washington DC is now in the hole and that's not even that's not even the beginning of it it's far worse than that you're going to have an economic collapse this can't go on so i want to integrate into my curriculum um uh, modules on inflation hyperinflation debt management and debt theory and I did all these. How do you operate in a hyperinflationary environment? There is even a module in my cattle marketing DVD in which we completely abandon the notion of a functioning currency, the US dollar, and we start trading cattle, quoting the price of cattle in terms of rounds of 223, in terms of gallons of diesel. Um, and I teach people how to calculate what the true price of corn is, because that's very much tied up uh, in terms of cattle, because you need to know how much it costs you to put a pound of gain on an animal. And that is intimately linked to the price of corn. Corn is kind of your benchmark. So even if there's massive, massive hyperinflation and you wake up one day and corn is trading for $40 a bushel and people are all just going to be looking around at each other saying, what does that even mean? We can't even get our heads around that. I teach people how to backward calculate so that they can always be oriented to what the value of these physical commodities is. And these concepts, it's presented, of course, in the context of cattle, certainly. It applies to everything. It's going to apply to automobiles, you know, junked out cars. What's the value of this? And if you know the mathematics and you understand the mathematics and you can keep your, your wits about you and your head about you, other people are going to be doing things like exchanging a, a one ounce gold coin for one meal. You see what I'm saying? When people get when people get desperate and confused and they just don't know what the hell's going on and also they're starving to death, people are going to start making incredibly bad decisions and trades because there's no way they don't understand how to value anything. And Americans are especially bad about this. In more peasant cultures, this that dynamic doesn't get quite so bad because people are still more grounded and earthy and rooted in reality in the American paradigm. Oh, yeah, you're going to have people doing things like exchanging a one ounce gold coin for one square meal. 
Uh, people have talked about uh, that kind of. I mean, it was was it uh, Warren Buffett or who that talks about volatility um, results in uh, mispricing and mispricing is opportunity. And this is exactly when people are uh, that that also there's that old saying that uh, what is it chance uh, or or fortune uh, favors the prepared mind. So uh, if you if your mind is prepared and you have the understanding and the other what's that Rudyard Kipling quote keep your head while all this about you are losing theirs so I I we've heard a lot of uh, wisdom through the ages that 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 uh, corroborate your your point that having your head about you and understanding how to do uh, bartering and understanding the valuation between different asset classes means you'll be able to. Um, uh, survive and thrive much better than people who are just desperately making emotional, you know, irrational decisions based on lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, and and, and a kind of emotional panic state. And if I may make a point about Christianity, we're not, and I am not, ever advocating any sort of cutthroat mentality. the The reality of the fact, the reality of the situation is, is that if you are functional and you have some wealth around you, what you are then in the position to do is to have acts of charity and to help out good people who need financial help. So it's not, you shouldn't be made to feel guilty about wanting to be financially sound and um, holding your buying power and your assets and your wealth together while these horrible events are unfolding because it is precisely in that that will permit you to manifest you know, corporal acts of, of intense charity towards these other pathetic people who are good people but are going to need help. You can't help anyone if you you were, you know, starving to death in a gutter because you didn't know what you were doing and because you didn't hold your financial house in order. So don't ever let anybody guilt trip you about being smart and savvy on the financial side because it is that feeds into Christian charity itself. And it enables you to be effective in positive ways, as you mentioned. I mean, this is even even the uh, every time we fly on an airplane, right? We get to hear that video that says, "When when the if the in the case of an emergency, you'll get these oxygen masks to drop down. Make sure you affix yours before assisting others." Is like you're you're no good. And the same thing exactly. when, yeah. in engineering training, when you talk about confined space entry, uh, where people go in, one person goes in and collapses from bad air. You don't run in after them. You've got to make sure that you have a harness and people pulling, you know, so you can get out because you're no good as a rescuer if um, if you run yourself ragged. Same thing has happened when people talk about, you know, you've got to get rest, you got to get a care for the caregivers, that kind of thing. And the it reminds exactly. me uh, the biblical story of Joseph and uh, uh, the coat of many colors traveling to Egypt, where he had had these visions. The, the emperor, the uh, Pharaoh, had 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 these dreams. Pharaoh about these uh, signs and symbols he didn't understand. Joseph correctly interpreted them as seven years of plenty will be followed by seven years of famine, that sort of thing over and over. And that by storehouses, store, store, and then what, how it played out was the people of uh, Egypt and surrounding nations, when the hard times, uh, first they depleted all of their meager stores, and then they showed up and said, you know, we, we want to buy... You know, we'll pay for the food. We want to buy food. We'll trade our first. We'll trade our money. We'll trade our lands. We'll trade our servitude. Whatever. Um, he had mm -hmm. he not prepared and stored up, he would not have been in the position to to rescue uh, those people. So, a lot of lot of lot exactly. of history behind exactly. what you're saying. So oh, yeah. um, that's a good point as far as um, not. Uh, it's not that you're planning on trying to position yourself to take advantage of others. It's that you want to protect and preserve uh, your own uh, life and, and liberty. And second of all, you want to be able to enable yourself to be around, be capable of helping others. Um, so right. can we talk about some how-to steps? Um, for As you mentioned, the, a lot of these are lost arts. So we've become so culturally disconnected from uh, where our food comes from, from the land itself. It reminds me of uh, back on the, the movie uh, Gone with the Wind where... Uh, uh, Scarlett O'Hara's father giving her his last words of wisdom. He says, "Hold on to the land. That's the only thing that lasts." We we've lo we've lost mm -hmm. that. I mean, ninety what percent of people uh, ha are completely disconnected. They they think uh, in their life, their rea their reality that they're currently living is that food comes from the store or from a restaurant. Um, so yes, uh, yes. So the very first steps aren't aren't known to people. So if you could kind of and and just a very high level summary, I was thinking of acquiring. 
how how would people go about searching for finding understanding what are the right things to even be looking for in terms of either land assets or livestock operations then how they can get learning education i guess that should probably come first and then you mentioned your ability to actually uh manage and work this uh, uh asset develop it in the face of either what we could consider a more or more or less normal seeming situation we have now versus what would, how would you picture doing that in, in a uh, collapse, after a collapse type situation, and then including guarding or protecting that asset? And then our, at the end, if we could talk about any loopholes or special situations that people might need to keep their awareness out for that might be able to uh, not do this the hard way, but do this in a way that might be you know fortunate for them and fortunate for someone else. So um, first of all, that, that learning, you already mentioned you have a DVD series about this uh in addition mm-hmm. to that uh we'll if you would um we'll put a link to that you can send that to me we'll put that a link in the comments um but uh sure. also any other learning opportunities you had this af- advantage of talking to a wise and experienced guy old timer but our what other um mm-hmm. asset what other information uh references would you encourage people to avail themselves of or support groups networks that sort of thing sure um for absolute beginners um there is, we do have a series of what are called land grant universities. So any of any of the universities that are such and such state, like Kansas State, Oklahoma State, Colorado State, et cetera. These are called land grant universities. This is generally where the agricultural programs are taught, and it's also where what's called the county extension programs. So that's where they're centered out of and they're administrated out of there. Pretty much every county in the United States has um, what's known as an extension agent and an extension office. And if you're an absolute rank beginner, that's kind of the place to start. That's what I I would recommend. Um, Look at where you want to be. Go to the county extension office and say, I would like information about, um, for example, if you're looking at cattle, I would like information about cattle production in your county, grazing, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the next question, well, I, I want to share an anecdote. I had years and years ago, I had a couple in Florida, and the guy was, um, the, the husband was, sitting on a pile of cash. He was a dentist and he ha- he was sitting on this money and wanted to invest in cattle. So they, they bought my cattle marketing DVD. They understood the arithmetic. They understood everything fine. Now it was time for them to finally go to the sale barn and start buying cattle. And they called me from inside of the sale barn and you could hear the cattle, you know, lowing in the ring and you could hear the, the chant of the auctioneer and they said, oh, we, we just wanted to call you and talk to you and let and let you know that we're finally buying cattle. And I said, oh, that's great. Hey, you never told me um, how many acres you got or what kind of forage, what your forage situation was. How many acres did you find? And the woman, very pious Catholic, said, we have just consecrated this entire project to the Immaculate Heart of the Blessed Virgin, and we're just going to let her take care of that. And I went through the roof. I was screaming at them on the phone, get out of that sale barn right now. Walk immediately to the door right now. Get out of there. Don't look at anybody. Don't make any gestures. Walk out of that sale barn right now. Why was I going through the roof? Because when she said that, I knew they didn't have any line, any land lined up. They went to this sale barn with the intention of buying these cattle And they didn't have anywhere to take them. This is kind of the level of where the contemporary urban suburban American is. It's that detachment and that complete lack of comprehension about any of this. This guy was a medical professional who was ready to buy a semi load full of 700 pound animals and he had nowhere to take them. And I just... I just, what do you do at that point? You just shake your head. So, ladies and gentlemen, the first thing you have to do before you even think about buying any cattle is you have to have somewhere to put them. Now, the question is, are you looking to buy? Do you have, or or if you're talking about, if you're sitting on millions that you want to invest, you could be looking at buying a ranch, okay? 
most people, I assume, in your listening group will be looking at leasing, leasing some grazing ground out somewhere. Okay, you need to talk to people. You need to talk to the extension agency in that area. You need to find out what the forage, what kind of forage, what the carrying capacity of the land is, seasonally, how many head um, can this parcel of land carry, and then, you know, Never, never go up to that. Always be less than that. Never exhaust a parcel of land. And you're going to have to research and figure this stuff out and then try to hit that sweet spot and get just the right number of head gaining weight on that parcel of land with that forage. What's the quality of the forage? Are you going to have to supplement it with anything? And again, extension agents are great for that, and land-grant universities are great for that. Um, my DVD set assumes it, it's actually geared towards quasi-beginners, um, but it does assume that you know the difference between a steer and a heifer. A steer is a castrated male. A uh, heifer is a female that has not yet had a calf. It, it, assume, it assumes that you know what a cow is. A cow is a mama cow whose intention is to, year after year, produce a calf. If you're going to produce calves out of cows, what do you have to have? You have to have a bull, don't you? So you're either going to be looking at having one or two bulls on your place or what a lot of people do now is artificial insemination. It's very, 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 very common because bulls can kind of be a pain in the neck sometimes because they're bulls and they run around and get excited when they see other cows and take out fences and things like that. So artificial insemination is very, very common. Do you intend to have lightweight calves that are, you know, gaining weight from, say, for example, 400 pounds to 750 pounds. Those are called feeder cattle. Or are you looking to have heavier type animals, you know, getting ready to go into the feedlot? So from 600 to eight or 900 pounds, getting ready to be placed in the feedlot. Are you intending to grass finish? Are you intending to just leave your cattle on grass all the way until they are at slaughter weight, which is 12, 13, 1400 pounds. At that point, is do you have a locker plant that you can send your animals to? Maybe after the collapse, I suspect what will happen is that the locker plants will be doing tremendous business. And there are also people that have um, mo- uh, mobile cattle slaughtering stations, mobile abattoirs, where they can roll into your place in basically this tricked out semi and you can have one or two cattle. They can process one or two cattle right there on your place. And then, you know, there's the meat. Okay, now here's another question. What If you're going to do that, where are you going to put the meat? Because we're talking about an animal that weighs, let's say, 1,200 pounds. That's going to yield, goodness gracious, that's going to yield 800 pounds worth of beef. Mm-hmm. Where are you going to put that? You you can't just put that in your fridge. You have to have somewhere to go with that. Either you have to have refrigeration, okay? In order to have refrigeration, you need to have um, a dedicated electricity source. Um, that now gets into questions of do you have a diesel tank, which I I advocate that everybody have a, has a diesel tank. I now have a diesel tank, which I'm over the moon tickled to death by I'm off the grid in terms of um, in terms of diesel you're going to have to have electricity you're going to have to be able to manage all these things so it's there's a lot to think about Um, most people before war breaks out and we're still in a normal situation and there are still grocery stores well let's be honest you're you're you're, you have the cattle in order to generate income for you, and then you're still going to the grocery store. Some people will process and process one of their own animals and then have the slaughter facility bring them and deliver to them, say, half of a carcass because it's just so many pounds of meat. Um, but for now, until war breaks out, the, po- the point of this is to make money off of the cattle and then you turn around and you go to the grocery store as normal or you buy in, in small quantities from the local kill plant or whatever like that. But these are all things that need to be thought about and you kind of need to be getting your ducks in a row. Um, but if you want to jump in really quickly, the, the fastest way to do it is to rent ground and then 
run cows. That's just about the easiest thing to do because the gestation for a cow is exactly the same as humans. It's nine months. So you're basically looking at an annual cycle. Once per year, you're going to have a crop of calves that come out of your cow herd and you're going to wean the calves, sort them away from the mama cows and send them off and either sell them private treaty or sell them through a a sale barn. So that if the easiest way to get started is to lease ground, don't buy, and then kick some cows out on it. That's the easiest, simplest way to go. But it's slow. It doesn't cash flow as much as trading cattle, trading feeder cattle does. And we talk about both of these paradigms. In fact, in my video, we talk about all three at length. We talk about trading lightweight feeder cattle. We talk about sending cattle to the feed yard and finishing cattle or finishing them on grass. And we also talk in depth about running a cow herd. So all three modes of the cattle business are covered, but you got the first step is you got to get some land, either buy or lease. And uh, then as far as managing the actual operation, um, uh, depending on the size of the operation, uh, what does that look like just at a very, very high level uh, for, for a rancher and, uh, or a ranch or a leaser? Um, and uh, and what uh, what do you see as both in the happy path of, of normal where there's normalcy left in the in the uh, society and the economy versus what would it p- potentially look like in a after a breakdown situation? Sure. In terms of a cow herd that can easily easily be done in terms of one's spare time in the evening or early in the morning. So if you're looking at keeping the job that you have right now and you want to do something on the side, a cow herd is the is the least intensive because they basically take care of themselves. You just need to check them every day or so. So if you're putting out uh, feed supplements, mineral supplements, things like that, you're doing you can do that stuff in the evening in your spare time. If you want to look at actual full-time work, full-time work would be the aggressive trading of feeder cattle, learning how to process cattle, run them through a chute, learning how to put ear tags in their ears, learning how to doctor them um, when they get pink eye, learning how to deal with that, et cetera, et cetera, Um, deworming them, putting anti-fly treatments on them, all that kind of stuff. And then the actual trading of the cattle. You can do that yourself. A lot of people use what's called order buyers, which is an agent who does those things for you. And that's probably what I would recommend if you can get in with either a neighbor, a friend who's experienced in all of this, or there are actual men who have the career of being one of these buying and selling agents. Um, and as with all things in in our post-Christian post-Western culture, there are dishonest people running around. But I will say this in defense of the North American cattle industry. Sure, there are some bad people running around. But, you know, relative to the mainstream of the culture, the cattle industry is still, I maintain, one of the a most morally pure, highest level, functional, morally functional um, industries in in our fallen culture. So yeah, you have to keep your eyes open and your ears open. And the other thing is to talk about it because it's it's a relatively small community. The cattle industry, obviously, because you know hardly anybody's actually running cattle anymore. These folks they know each other, and it's kind of a way of self policing and self protection. If some guy does something that's just blatantly dishonest and certainly if he's blatantly dishonest repeatedly that gossip just goes goes through the community like lightning and you'll probably get some pretty good advice from locals and people that you meet on who who's a really good person and who's a good christian person that you can do business with and uh, you might want to avoid him uh he's known for trying to you know dump sick cattle off on people things like that that those that information set just spreads like wildfire. So talk to people. Don't isolate yourself. Get to know your get to know your neighbors, which is always good advice. And uh, as far as if there were a, and this is of course speculating, but in the case, and maybe we have some historical examples to go on. I certainly, <laughs> growing up, uh, thinking about the old cowboy shows you used to watch, there was always talk about cattle wrestlers, always always trying to catch the cattle wrestlers, and that's what branding was all about too, and everything. So, uh, can you give us a uh, some of your thoughts, either from speculation or from uh, what you're aware of, actually has has transpired uh, in in a um, either a lawless or a uh, 
uh, breakdown type situation, uh, what people have, what have been effective, uh, reasonable expectations people should have as far as how they're going to need to keep their, their asset, protect their asset and be able to continue to develop it. Right. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it's an interesting thing. Obviously, um, the incidence of cattle theft, of rustling, is going up. Um, it's a pretty, it's a specialized kind of a criminal outfit because you have to, you have to know what you're doing and you have to have a trailer. It's also risky because a lot of times, um, if, if you're trying, if when these guys are trying to rustle cattle out of like a, a small feedlot or something like that, they're so close to the house where the people are living that this makes a tremendous racket. I mean, hear, hearing a semi pull into your place in the middle of the night, what they're generally going for is cattle that are out, way out. But even then, it's, la- it's labor intensive because they have to go, they have to gather the cattle, they have to drive the cattle, and then get them loaded onto onto a semi, it's, it's a pretty difficult thing to do. Um, but it is happening. There's more of this going on. Um, and the, the industry trade groups, the national cattlemen's beef association, the Texas and Southwest cattle raider, cattle raisers association, um, outfits like that. That's one of the things they're actually working on is improved security and so forth. But on the other hand, we have technology on our side and there, there are now technologies, as we all know, because we're all being tracked by our cell phones and things like that. There are things that you can do to have, you know, like when you, people can put that, uh, that chip on their car and it, if your car is ever stolen, you can track where your car is. Right. I, th- I think most new cars now probably have that just intrinsically built into them, which is creepy in a way. But in another sense, y- there are tracking technologies. Um, and there's also branding and things like that. But there is an increased incidence of it, uh, just in my opinion. And I, this is one of my mantras that I've said for years and years and years. If you can't stand in front of something with with an AR and defend it, then you don't really own it. Um, I w- I would recommend obviously that whoever is living in proximity to cattle should be armed and should be ready to go if anybody rolls in and tries to back a semi up to your up to your your loading chute. You know you need to be ready to go. The other thing that's very effective is having dogs around. Dogs that will just absolutely go bonkers and raise hell if anybody rolls in there in the middle of the night. And having a good cattle dog around is just I think. I, I'm in favor of cattle dogs. A, a real, true working working dog can be a tremendous help, especially to somebody who's just getting started. Any, um, if this sounds, um, oh, and also, so I suppose in, in terms of being able to stand there and guard, it means you're on guard. You you are you're on the hook to be guarding your cattle, unless you're going to hire someone else to do that um, or leverage technology in some way. Um, do you are you aware of uh, people who I mean, if they ever want to go visit their relatives or be leave town you know go on vacation or anything like that what what uh types of um arrangements do people typically make uh, i know it must vary widely but just what are some examples of typical ways that people can have someone watching after their cattle if they need to be away Sure, absolutely. Understand that if you've got cattle in confinement, if you're trading feeder cattle especially and the cattle need to be fed by hand every day and aren't just kicked out on pasture like like a cow herd would be, then absolutely you are tied to those animals and you have to work and you have to work on Sunday and our Lord understands this. It could always be worse. The the most labor intensive um, animal agricultural paradigm is actually running a dairy because if the if the cows don't if dairy cows don't get milked, their udders will explode and they will die horrible horrible deaths. And so that's why dairymen are known for having to get up at three thirty in the morning and they have to get out there and they have to milk those cows. Um, cat, uh, um, beef cattle are less are less intensive, but yes, you have to hook up with uh, neighbors family members, friends, whatever, or hired man. Um, if you, if you're resigned to moving out into the country and actually living on site, a lot of people just have a hired man because, you know, there's a father, but then it's too much work for one man to do by himself. And so you have the hired man who generally works by the hour. And then when you're gone, 
um, you, he can cover for you, and then when he takes time off, you can cover for him and you can get by. But that's, a, yeah, that's a great point. That's another thing that you have to think about is that these animals, most of the time, you're going to have a daily work commitment, a daily feeding commitment to them. And so you're going to have to, again, get to know your neighbors and talk to people, especially if you're living completely apart and separate from other family members. And uh, last of all, if if there are any special uh, loopholes or special situations that you've seen or that uh, people can be aware of or watch out for if it uh, to be as opportunities that, you know, if you can find a situation where a person needs this and you need this and it, and it can come together for you uh, with a lot less than just the the most, you know, mainstream path of saying, I got to have millions of dollars. Like you mentioned, you can lease land. That, that's a quick in to being able to, to start using land as a lease instead of purchase it. Are there other situations like that where you can, you know, take over an operation or, or, or inherit or whatever? Oh, oh, absolutely. That That's the tragedy of the North American, especially the cattle industry, is that as each year goes on, more and more of these old timers are selling out. And because they never learned how to do the business right and and they didn't make the kind of money that they should have made. Their children don't want anything to do with inheriting and staying on the place and continuing the operation. And so all over the country, there are small operations where the the man is in his 70s or 80s and he's either retiring or he dies and then the entire kitten caboodle goes up for sale and so you can buy a relatively small parcel of land you know say 80 acres or something like that and that 80 acres will have on it a house where these this old couple or this old man presumably lived and then is either retiring off of or died and then there will be some extant facilities there. Oftentimes, there will be just an entire functioning estate that will come up for auction. This is going on all the time. And so if you keep an, figure out where you want to be, where you want to live, what's the, best, what's the best fit for you, and then start looking at real estate and estate liquidation and auction listings because people are are dying out of the cattle industry and not being replaced. And here are all of these little gems, these these completely ready-to-go, packaged, almost turnkey operations, ready to go, and they just they just get piecemealed out, whereas there should be an influx of younger people coming in, just picking up where, where the older people left off. That's what's so scary about it is that because there's been this incompetence on the financial side coming out of the disorder of the welfare state and government intervention and markets and so forth, it's driven all of the young people away. And so the industry's aging to death and dying. So I think, you know, it's a case of, of God working in mysterious ways that there's now this generation of younger people who didn't grow up in agriculture, but the light bulb is going off over their heads saying, aha, this is where I need to be. This is where I need to go. And look, he- here are all these incredible situations. And because people think that agriculture is a hopeless grind, the price structure is relatively low for these assets. I mean, you can get into a relatively small but functional and usable parcel parcel of land with a house on it. Now, it's not going to be a suburban McMansion with granite countertops or anything like that. And you could conceivably, over the course of, of 10 years, provided we have that long, you could work slowly on remodeling or expanding the house or doing whatever you want. But you're going to be moving into a house that was probably built, let's be honest, in the in the 1950s or or maybe even a pre-war an older pre-war type house out in rural America and it's going to it's going to be good enough it's going to be good enough and that's that's something that we all need to get through our heads as Americans is that you know the absolute best of the best if that's if that's your standard of expectation you're going to go insane what we all need to be start thinking about is good enough let's find something that's good enough and then make sure it's physically clean and physically safe and then we can go from there start focusing on good enough and there's just buku properties like that all over the united states 
Well, Anne, if there's any other major stone I've left unturned here, could you, uh, if there's anything else you can think of to add to people who are considering, just wanting to look into this more, find out more, consider it seriously? Sure. I think we've covered a, actually a tremendous amount of ground. Um, and I just want to give the details about my DVD. It's it's not totally inexpensive. It is $500, uh, but it's 16 hours. It's my full seminar. You'll have it in your home for the rest of your life, so you can go over and review it and review it and review it. It comes with a full color, 65-page workbook. And after the initial lecture, when I'm lecturing about you know, how to execute marketing and so forth, it then turns into basically a ginormous mathematical practicum. And so you have this 65 page workbook that's just all about doing out the mathematics, the arithmetic. It's not about my opinion. It's not the opinion of the man who trained me. None of it is opinion. And that's why when I saw it, I was instantly instantly sold because the first thing when I met the old man who trained me, he sat me down and he gave me a tablet and a pencil and he said, all right, I'm going to show you how to do this math. Math is constant, unchanging. It, it, it is true. It makes sense. It's rooted in reality. You don't have to forecast anything. You don't need any magic, magic form, formulas. And you can, in fact, do all of this arithmetic sitting in the pickup, scrawling it out on the back of an old envelope. It's, it's that easy. It's addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And there's, I guess technically you could say there's a teeny tiny bit of algebra, but just in the sense of solving for x, which again is just a function of usually subtraction and division to solve for x. We can all do that. We're talking about sixth grade level arithmetic, okay? It's 500 bucks. You've got it for the rest of your life. Um, and that's pretty much it. I've never, I've not increased the price at all since I first made it, even though the price of cattle in the pat over the past five years almost doubled and then it pulled back, but it, there was a massive inflationary phase about three years ago where the price of cattle almost doubled in about 18 months. And boy, I tell you what, the people who had been through my school, they were eternally grateful in terms of being able to keep their heads about them when prices were going through the roof, and also in terms of the admonition that I gave to all those people is that I said, look, if we have a hyperinflationary event, or even a mildly inflationary event, and you find yourself suddenly sitting on top of all of these cattle that are worth a whole heck of a lot more than what you paid for them just because of the price inflation, do not be stupid and go borrow more money retain the equity in those animals and pay off, pay down your debt and get detached from the banks. We're also very big about that. Get If you have to go into debt just to get started, your objective should be to get out of debt as fast as you possibly can. And that's something that an inflationary environment will allow you to do. You'll be able to pay off your note and then operate entirely on your own cash. And then brother, you just own the world when you're in that situation. So um, if, you, if you have any interest in this at all, um, I will put a link up on barnhart.biz. In fact, I'll put a link up on the main permanent menu bar that says Cattle Marketing DVD. I'm off the grid, so the ordering instructions are, are pretty specific. I, I appreciate cash, I appreciate money orders, and I, I can do checks, but there are very specific instructions for all that. You will need to contact me, um, preferably via email, and then I will email back to you and say, okay, this is, this is what we need to do. This is where you send the money. And then I do have people who are taking care of all this, and generally the DVD set, once they receive payment, it ships back out the next business day by priority mail. So the turnaround on it is pretty quick. Great, and uh, your uh, we'll we'll also include your email um, in the in the link. I'm 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 putting this into the notes as we go. Um, I already put your barnhart.biz link in there and your email. Ann at barnhart.biz. A N N at barnhart.biz.
Thank you, Anne, so much. This has been a bit of an unusual topic. Ironic, isn't it, that this is probably most, one of the most traditional topics that could you could think of in the human history, and yet it's it's almost exotic for us to be talking about it. So thank you so much for being here and being our guide to truth that uh, people may be keenly interested in knowing because it certainly will separate them from the herd. Ah, very good. Good, good pun there. Well done, sir. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. All right, talk to you later. <laughs>